Well, hello. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a filmmaker in San Francisco, and I have decided to start recording some of my work and posting it up as a, like not a tutorial because that implies I've mastered these things, um, and I certainly have not. But just as a peek into workflow, I've definitely watched a lot of these things, um, tutorials, and then also just screen captures of people working as a way of figuring out what their workflow is and learning from that and um, it's always been incredibly helpful so uh, I wanted to start doing the same as a way of showing my process and how I'm working through some of these uh, either technical issues or ideas or challenges and um, just sort of what my problem solving technique is so hopefully you will find it useful um, and hopefully you'll enjoy it uh, so for this project what I was doing is I've been working on a sci-fi film for the last few years um, uh, my friend Tim Sessler was the DP on this, so uh, I directed it, he shot it. Um, uh, it's uh, got a lot of visual effects, a lot of green screen work, and um, it's just taken a long time to get all these visual effects done because I've done most of those on my own. Um, so one thing that's come up a few times in this process is I've been widening shots. And um, so, for example, in uh, this scene, which is on a green screen, I widened the shot. I think we shot this originally with probably a 35 millimeter lens and I widened it out to a 17.5 millimeter lens. Um, and that's relatively easy to do in a green screen shot because, you know, you're cutting out the background anyway and you're rendering it. So that wasn't too difficult. Um, but once I started doing that and I felt like, oh, I have this freedom to change the angles of the shots occasionally, uh, I started wanting to do it with other shots that were not on green screen. And the primary offender that I really wanted to get was here, this shot, where I um, was dealing with um, pretty tight angles in a uh, um, small set that we'd built. And we couldn't really go all the way wide because um, I just didn't have that much set built. Um, I only had two row, or wa uh, one really row, one aisle of these pods actually physically built. So we weren't able to go much further than that. So the, the first thing you're going to want to do is have a really solid track of your shot. Um, there's a lot of great tracking software out there right now. It's, um, it's pretty affordable. You can get something like Synthize. After Effects has one built in. The one I am using is actually the motion camera tracker in um, Cinema 4D. I think it's really solid, it, and it, it integrates nicely straight into Cinema 4D, obviously. And it has a lot of great tools for refining your track to make sure you get exactly what you want. So you can use constraints to say, well, this tracking point is at the floor of the scene. This, These two represent the y-axis. They're exactly this far apart and that sort of thing. So you can really dial in the scale and perspective of your scene with some, some precision. Um, and that's really handy, especially for something like this, where you're going to be trying to rebuild a scene and match to it. Um, the um, It took a little bit to get the right um, track on this because um, there's a lot of reflections, there's a lot of distortion on the lens on the sides, not a lot, but enough. And um, there's all sorts of things you need to be careful of. So... Um, I did some refining, and I actually uh, don't think I recorded all that. I sort of opened that up here mid-sequence here. Um, but by and large, what that process is is just finding tracks that don't look accurate and deleting them. Once you have that, you have a nice solid track, then you can start dropping in the geometry. And as what you'll see is I actually have this scene already built. I had a rebuilt the scene and those pods and extrapolated it out, so I have like many, many rows of these things. I'm light fixtures and ventilation systems and cable conduits and everything all ready to go. Um, that's for another render that I had done of this room. So I had all that stuff sort of pre-made and pre-textured. Um, so you drop that in and start lining it up and what you'll find uh, is that it's never quite right. It's never quite exactly what you want. But if you, you um, move it around enough, you can get it to close enough. And this is really a close enough sort of scenario. Um, we're not doing anything that's, you know, got to be pixel perfect. We just sort of have to know what is our acceptable level of imperfection. Um, and um, once you've done that, um, you can use the footage as a source, as a guide. Um, 
So what, oh, I had some crashes here. I think that's, oh yes, so I was using Arnold, so I was having problems with relinking textures. And so when I was rendering it out the preview in Arnold, it was crashing. But once you have a preview render in Arnold, you can look and compare, and, and what you'll see is, okay, we're close, we're getting there. There's some problems, the light fall off on the wall is the first thing that I see, and so um, what I started doing was, is messing around with um, the lights, the overhead light fixtures that I built, and moving those around to so that I can match that, that kind of nice vignetted fall off that you see on the, the camera, the original source footage. Um, so moving those light banks around got me some mixed results, got me a couple crashes it looks like, because, you know, but after a bit, you know, moving the lights around, I was able to get it pretty close. And then I think I threw in a point light. Yep, there's a point light uh, to just sort of finish off that vignetting effect to make it match as close as possible. So what you wind up with is pretty close. The, other, the next thing I did was I actually just started playing around with the focal length. So I started with a 35 millimeter lens, just cut that in half. Now you have 17.5. That's a twice as wide lens. Um, and as you can see, it goes pretty dramatic in terms of the the change. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so I set it up to render and sent it up to um, Pixel, Pixel Plow, which is an online render farm. I um, have used them quite a bit. They're very good. Uh, and what's nice is you can sort of set your priority level. So your power level can be low or high, depending on how urgent it is that you get things done. Um, cheaper renders take longer time. and. Uh, for this, I was able to set it very cheap because I had no time limit on this. And it's it's like 21 frames. It's less than a second of footage. So even a slow renderer on Pixel Plow is going to be faster than my computer would be able to do it. Uh, so nope, no big deal. Um, then I brought the C4D shot into After Effects. Uh, now After Effects has the Cineware plugins or, or pipeline or whatever they call it. And so you can just draw, drag and drop C4D files into After Effects. And then the, you can put them into your timeline and they'll render at this various, uh, I have it just as like this software shading and just basically as a draft. Um, and that gives you an immediate idea of how close you are with your geometry. And as you can see, it's, it's on the right side, it's actually pretty darn close. There's a couple things. I'm noticing those pod locks are way too big and some of the perspective is off. The first thing I played around with was just using something like corner pin uh, the to, to um, match and to skew it a little bit. And then also just masking out some of the edges to see how well it blends. But it wasn't ultimately close enough to my liking. So I went back into Cinema 4D. And actually, I would say the bulk of what I did after this was just trying to line up those the geometry of the, the pods more accurately. Um, and that's a lot of work because you're trying to match something that was, you know, built on theater flats that are probably leaning a little bit, a degree here and there, and I uh, don't have like acrylic glued to them that may or may not be bubbling or flush or God knows what. There's no flush or or there's no plumb angles <laughs> in reality, whereas in software it's all like down to the degree, or hundredth of a degree or thousandth of a degree. So that will, will never really line up. But um, you can sit around and play around with it and get it as close as you can, and that's basically what I did. One thing I noticed was the knobs are too big, so I was adjusting the scale of those to make those feel a little bit more natural and, and blend in better. Um, I wound up basically minimizing the scene a bit, just down to these two pods and lining those up. Once I had those in a pretty good spot, I started lining in the rest of the geometry, like the wall, and, um, and then started doing some renders. Um, so going back into After Effects with that C40 file, you can see the perspective feels a lot more lined up. The pod locks don't really line up as well as I had hoped, but they're they're getting there. So once I had like enough of the frame rendered out of Cinema 4D, I think I just did a quick uh, save of that file and brought it in so that I could start seeing how well the edges would blend. Um, so that's an incomplete frame that I would drop in and um, put it underneath. And you know what? It's It's not bad. Like, that's pretty close. Um, certainly close enough uh, to, to start working with. So, um, obviously, part of it is the masking and cleaning up some of these edges. And the rest is, like, color correction and other compositing things. So trying to get the color levels and the contrast levels to be right. So the right number of the right amount of blue in the shadows, making sure that feels about right, and then making sure that just the overall contrast is similar. And then it's it's dialing in the edges of the, the mask and making sure that that looks natural. 
and you know um, some other things that I noticed when I started putting it in was that the, the edges just looked a little too clean and I wanted it to have a little bit more texture to it so adding in a little bit of um, vignetting to the sides so I think I just did yeah I just did that with a black solid and using some masks and feathering those out and that helps add a little bit of um, you know volume to the space and shows there's shadowing from other objects it doesn't feel like it's just a big nothing space um, even here I'm actually okay with this as a shot like there's a, some problems like there's that hard line obviously the mask needs to get refined but there's stuff there's a lot of good going on here um, so refining the mask, I think I wound up, yep, cutting up the top there, playing with that, trying to refine some of those things. Um, and then the other problem here is you see he's basically a ghost. He doesn't have a reflection. He's like a vampire. Um, and that won't work. So on the left, I, I uh, dropped in the reflection. And the main thing there was lining that pod uh, lock up. So I actually had to move the reflection off uh, where it would be. And if you look really close, you'll see, like, yeah, that doesn't look very realistic because... The perspective is off in that shot, and there's some other problems there. But, um, again, no one's going to notice this in a 20-frame shot, 21-frame shot, uh, or I guess 22-frame, whatever. No one's going to notice. Uh, I did the other side of the reflection. Now, there's that hard edge where the, ed, uh, uh, where the frame ended, so I was sort of had to, like, feather it out and make it look as close as I could. Um, but, by and large, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, Adding, I added some bokeh to this using the Z-Pass out of Cinema 4D. Use the film grain to add some, you know, just this universal uh, flat grain texture to everything. And um, it feels good to me. If, now, it doesn't feel perfect. Like, I can sit here and just pick it apart, no problem. There are a ton of problems with it. But um, it accomplishes what it needed to, which is it helps that scene feel a little bigger. It helps give you a little bit more context about this room and the size of the room um, if I were really ambitious I could cut him out completely and re-render this room with just him standing there as like a little 2D um, paper doll or something and do this differently but this this works for now and, and gives me enough um, and um, these are the sorts of things that you can do now if you're willing to put in the time and, and learn some of these new tools that are frankly pretty nuts um, what you can do. Uh, I certainly wish I'd been able to do this a lot sooner in my career. Um, it's really amazing. Uh, it gives you a lot more freedom later on when you're deciding how to tell a story and, and what's important to you and, and uh, helps you you change a lot of things. Um, I would say it's, it's dangerous in some level to be making a lot of changes in post. You don't want to be um, doing this excessively. This is sort of like a last-ditch effort. You want to do this only when you need to. You want to do this when it's the the least obtrusive way. Um, the better option is to have a bigger set, but, but we can't always afford that. The better option is to to um, to plan to do this and so you have the right kind of markers in place so you have an easier camera track. But there will always be surprises. There will always be things that you just can't account for. And um, when you can learn these tools, you can do pretty incredible things to help improve your, your stories. Anyway, I hope this was helpful for you to watch. If you have any questions, I'm always happy to try and answer those. Um, I won't pretend to be an authority. Um, and if you have ideas on how to do this better or if you have techniques that have worked for you, please share those as well because that's super valuable for me and anyone else who watches this. Anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed this. hope this was helpful or informative or in any way um, good use of your time.